diversity acknowledges that indigenous peoples and nation, including Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill, Pocasset, Neantic, Quinnipiac, and other Algonquin speaking peoples have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now known as the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this land. The Divinity School recognizes the role that Christianity played in colonization movements and repudiates the use of Christianity or any religion for purposes of oppression. We encourage all to work for justice in the aftermath of colonization and to reject racism and anti-indigenous attitudes in all forms. Please be seated. Thank you, Daryl. And for those who are new students, Daryl can't get enough of this place. She is back for a second degree. <laughs> and we're thrilled to have her. Welcome to the 323rd year of Yale University and the 202nd year of Yale Divinity School as an independent unit within the university. Yale Divinity School includes three partners. Berkeley Divinity School, led by Dean Andrew McGowan in its 52nd year. The Institute of Sacred Music, led by Director Martin Jean in its 51st year. And the Andover Newton Seminary, led by Dean Sarah Drummond, represented by Ned Parka. Sarah is dropping off her daughter at college as we speak, so she has a very good excuse. And on behalf of all of the faculty, the staff, all of our partners, we welcome you to the beginning of a promising new year. We will celebrate a number of milestones this year. Two groups are celebrating anniversaries. ISM delayed their 50th anniversary celebration from last year until this year, and so they're celebrating it this year. You have a choice to celebrate it in the year or after you're actually 50, so they chose the latter. YBS is celebrating its 55th anniversary at Yale Divinity School. There'll be a number of activities. We will have a special commencement ceremony this year on September the 14th in Battelle Chapel to honor and bestow degrees on two long-standing individuals that is long-standing in terms of waiting for a degree, the Reverend James Pennington and the Reverend Alexander Crummel. This is part of Yale's reckoning with its past. President Salovey appointed a Yale and Slavery Working Group on October 14th, 2020, led by Professor David Blight, who was assisted by a large number of scholars and students throughout the university, including some of the faculty sitting in the chancel and some of the students who are sitting or who sat where you now sit. Professor Blight's report will appear in the form of a monograph and be released in February. I hope that we'll all have an opportunity to read it. The other piece of news that I want to mention is, at long last, we are going to have a groundbreaking on October the 11th for the Living Village. And some of us want to say, hallelujah. <laughs> Uh, so apologies for the mess and the confusion that construction will bring for the next two years, but it will be worth it in the end. Now as important as all of these events are, the most important reason for us to celebrate today is the addition of new people to our community. Let me start with new faculty. I'm just going to take them in alphabetical order. 
The Reverend William Barber, who is not with us, he, he will be here this week, but the most important moral voice in America today, at least in my judgment, joined us last January as the founder of the Center of Public Theology and Public Policy. And when I read your name, would you stand? So Adrian Emmanuel Hernandez Acosta joins us as an assistant professor of religion and literature, coming fresh from a PhD at Harvard and a postdoc at Brown. Bo Kyung Blinda Eam, an alum of 2012, comes to us as an assistant professor of sacred music and divinity, following her doctorate at the University of Pennsylvania and a postdoc at Harvard. Jerry Street, Reverend Jerry Street, who's I think sitting back up there, <laughs> who, who has been a, right here, a member of the Yale community for over 40 years and a member, a part-time member of this faculty for 35 years. You might say it's about time you made him full-time, uh, but joins us as an associate professor to run the joint degree program in social work that we have with the University of Connecticut. We are also being joined by Todney Thomas, who was here last year. Yes, Todney. As a visiting presidential fellow, uh, but is now a tenured associate professor, she's joining us from the faculty at Harvard Divinity School. So we're thrilled to have all five of those individuals. And I wasn't sure how many new staff, we have a good number of new staff, we have some in the room, but if you're staff and you weren't here last year at this time, would you now stand and let us recognize you? There are some here, I know. A Yale PhD, no less, back over there, uh, I know. Uh, but the biggest group, by far, is of course the 120 new degree-seeking students. 51 MARs, and for the first time in a good number of years, 59 more MDivs than MARs this year. That's a first in several years nine STMs and one non-degree seeking student. 13% of you are international, coming from Brazil, Canada, China, Egypt, Indonesia, Malaysia, Nepal, South Korea, Trinidad and Tobago, and the UK. You range in age from 21 to 72, with an average age just a little over 31. 36% of you, 36%, over a third, already hold an advanced degree. And I counted at least, I don't know if I got the full report, but there are at least 18 different advanced degrees <laughs> held by the incoming class. And they include a number of people with JDs, MDs, DMAs, and PhDs. So to, to each of you, whether you have an advanced degree or are coming straight from undergraduate, we are thrilled you're here. You come from a very wide range of backgrounds. For example, three of you have already established very impressive musical careers. Uh, Ileana Barwinski is a classical singer and the winner of two major awards. Beverly Love is an operatic soprano who's performed throughout the world. And Sophia Spiegel is the founder and lead singer, just so we have a little variety, of Neo Soul and Indie Funk Band. Uh, so a good variety in the class. Others have significant roles in business or politics. Jim Cox Chapman, the former chief medical officer of pro-health physicians. Whitney Coe, the vice president and director of national program for rural strategies. And a featured speaker at all kinds of events, including, and I mentioned this one because she's one of ours, that is one of our alums, Krista Tippett's podcast. And you, you have to be somebody to be on one of Krista's <laughs> podcasts. Uh, or I could mention Andrew Springer, who's the former social media producer for Good Morning America. And the list goes on. Uh, so I'm sorry I can't give everyone's background, but it gives you an idea of the range and diversity with which people are coming to this school. You're joining 159 very talented returning students 
And I want to say we are delighted to see you again. Uh, it's wonderful to welcome new students, but I sat down in chapel the other day in the midst of a group of returning students, and it was really good to see some familiar faces. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> so uh, all together, if you had everyone, including the uh, exchange students who are here and all of the part-timers and the non-degrees, we have 301 students. So for those of you who are curious, it's our tradition to recognize the students who welcomed all of you to BTFO. There were 21 students who worked very creatively and diligently to make orientation a special experience for all of you. They were led by four coordinators, and I'm going to ask the coordinators to come up uh, as I call your names, if you would. Please hold your applause till they're all up here, and then I'm going to call three staff to join them as well. Uh, the new students will all recognize them, and they're friends of the returning students. But the coordinator for BTFO this year was none other than Antonio Vargas. Antonio, uh, he, he made BTF phone and it wore him out, so he's not here. Hmm. All right, his chief of staff this year was Terrence McQueen. Uh, Terrence is here. Terrence, please come up. And for all of you who ate a meal and enjoyed the hospitality, the hospitality captain this year was Lizzie Hans. And to introduce all of you to what class might be like at YDS, the director or coordinator for diving into divinity was Lauren Hoagland. So Lauren, would you come up? Wait a minute. Thank you. And we need to recognize three staff who worked with them. For the first time, she ran a BTFO. Uh, and she did this with aplomb. Associate Dean Vicki Flippin. She was, she was assisted by, with, I'm just going to call him your right hand or them your right hand, but Kit Healy. Where's Kit? And both of them, thank you, Kim. Both of them were aided by the indefatigable uh, help of uh, Shafton Haley. Shafton. Thank you. There were 17 other students who volunteered to help. If you are one of them, would you please stand? now, and will you all join me in giving all of them a round of applause. It's our tradition as well to engage in a little hazing ritual <laughs> with new faculty. That is, we ask them to help lead this particular service. Now, we do two things. First, we're going to ask student leaders to help us. So the student council president, uh, Jamal Davis Neal, Jr., and the YBS president, uh, Andre, where's Andre? Right, oh, right here in front of me, are going to be our scripture readers today. And we've already heard from Daryl, who read the land acknowledgement. But we'll ask two new faculty to lead us in prayer. Professor Blinda Ean will lead the invocation, and Professor Adrian Emmanuel Hernandez Acosta will lead the benediction. The speaker today is Professor Teresa Morgan. She got a pass last year. She only had to lead the benediction in her first year, but you only get passes for so long. 
<laughs> Professor Morgan joins us from Oxford University. Uh, and she is here at YDS, the McDonald Agape Professor of New Testament and Early Christianity. She has a degree in classics from Cambridge University, a degree in theology from Oxford University, and a degree in music, she plays the violin and the viola, if you're wondering, from the uh, Royal Academy of Music. She is the author of eight books and counting, that they roll off the press. But I want to mention two that changed the fields. Her first book, Literate Education in the Hellenistic and Roman Worlds, is a standard textbook for anyone who wants to study education in the ancient world. A couple of years ago, she published a book entitled Roman Faith and Christian Faith that challenged New Testament scholars around the world to rethink the way that they understood pistis, faith, in the New Testament. She argued we should understand it as trust uh, in a relationship. And it received a great deal of attention. Not only that, just before she came here, she had two major awards. She was the PI of a Templeton grant, major, major grant, and won a Leverhulme Award from the British government. And if you know what a MacArthur Genius Grant is, this is better than that in England. <laughs> uh, now, it's pretty unusual for a scholar to write a book that changes a field, but to write two that change fields and different fields is quite extraordinary. It's wonderful if a scholar wins one of these huge awards, but to win two at the same time is virtually unheard of. She will be our speaker and is on our faculty, and we are very pleased that she is on our faculty. So now with these introductions in place, we begin the serious business of today, and I invite Professor Keem to lead us in her invocation. Peace be with you. Please join me in prayer. Creator God, the one who renews, who breathes life into dry bones, we thank you for new beginnings. Thank you for this academic year, for convening us here today as a community of learning, worship, and fellowship, a community called to serve you, each other, and our neighbors. God of love, as we look ahead to the fall semester, we ask that you speak to us. You know us intimately. You know that each of us brings our own hopes and desires, doubts and worries. Guide us so that we are not left daunted by the numerous and unknown tasks that lie ahead. We ask that you cover us with your love that drives out all fear. Attune our hearts to that of yours so that we would learn to rest in you, to draw assurance in your loving purpose, your steadfast character, and your unwavering goodness. Let humility and generosity, which you have modeled for us in your son, Jesus Christ, flow abundantly through our spaces of learning, worship, and fellowship. As we engage in the challenging task of spiritual and intellectual formation, help us filter out the extraneous noise and to discern your voice. Your voice that at times resounds like raucous laughter and at other times whispers to us in moments of quiet awakening. Your voice that has guided us here and will continue to guide us today, tomorrow, and into eternity. God of light and truth, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you. Give us courage to confront harmful assumptions, and in the process, give us the wisdom to honor each other as siblings. Guard us from the temptation of speaking out of prideful ego. And finally, Holy Spirit, comforter, we ask for empathy to understand and to stand in solidarity with those who face struggles and hardships. Help us create a community, a home, 
in which each of us knows that we are valued and that we belong. And let the revelations gleaned from our communal work flow abundantly to bless our neighbors in New Haven and beyond. As we draw near to you and learn to delight in your presence anew, draw near to us. Remind us that you are more than enough. Be glorified. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good afternoon, beloved community. A reading from the book of Proverbs. Does not wisdom call out? Does not understanding raise her voice? At the highest point along the way where the paths meet, she takes her hand, her stand, beside the gate leading into the city. At the entrance, she cries aloud. To you, O people, I call out. I raise my voice to all mankind. You who are simple gain prudence. You who are foolish set your hearts on it. Listen, for I have trustworthy things to say. I open my lips to speak what is right. My mouth speaks what is true, for my lips detest wickedness. All the words of my mouth are just. None of them is crooked or perverse. To the discerning, all of them are right. They are upright to those who have found knowledge. Choose my instruction instead of silver, knowledge rather than choice gold, for wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing you desire can compare with her. The Lord brought me forth as the first of the Lord's works. Before the Lord's deeds of old, I was formed long ages ago. Then I was constantly at God's side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in God's presence, rejoicing in God's whole world, and delighting in humankind. Now then, my children, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Listen to my instruction and be wise. Do not disregard it. Blessed are those who listen to me, watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway for those who find me find life and receive favor from the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be, Thanks be to God. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Happy New Year. So, this afternoon, I would like to share with you three short stories about the best education I ever had, the most fun I ever had teaching, before I came here, that is, <laughs> and the most unexpected lesson I ever learned. And the best education I ever had was in Germany at the Cologne Academy of Music and Dance with the great violinist Igor Ozim. Well known to you all, I'm certain. Because Ozim was a perfectionist. He was notorious in those days for taking elite students and making them play nothing but open strings for months and rebuilding their technique from the bottom up. Imagine being you know, an elite athlete and going to a coach who makes you relearn how to walk. And it was like that. Well, mercifully, I escaped that. But for the first few weeks I was there, I practiced one dotted rhythm in a Brahms sonata for hours a day until my arms were like the inside of a Swiss watch. <laughs> and every lesson was a masterclass, literally, because Ozim taught in a huge, high room overlooking the city with tables all around the walls and a grand piano in the middle with a fearsome accompanist. And students would drop in and out all day, sit around, listen to each other, criticize each other, translate the jokes. You know. And our aim was to develop the highest technical perfection in the service of the deepest interpretation of the music. Focalized 
through the unique personality of the performer, because a musician, like any artist, plays the person they are, as well as the instrument and the music. But to do that, Ozim was also teaching us to hold ourselves open to that mysterious inspiration that comes from beyond the music or the performer, but sometimes just strikes the performance and ignites the air between the performer and the audience and puts us in touch with something we can't reach out and capture, but which can capture us. It was unbelievably hard work. It was also a joyous dance of craft and creativity, muscle and brain and soul. And it was essentially exactly the same exercise as we perform as academics. When we hone our skills to interpret the world around us, but also hold ourselves open to revealing sometimes something beyond what we can reach for ourselves, but which can reveal itself through us. For some reason though, I think we are less good or maybe just less brave than musicians and other artists at expressing what we're trying to do in academic work. But I think we should be braver about that. Well, that was learning. The most fun I ever had teaching was in a very different space, because for many years when I taught at Oxford University, my favorite teaching gig of the year was the day I spent teaching MBA students at the business school the elements of ancient Greek rhetoric. <laughs> now, as in all business schools, these students were paying a lot of money <laughs> for a course which they hoped would equip them to earn a lot more. <laughs> so they were really listening. And my course centered on Aristotle's rhetoric, which is still the best book ever written in the West about how to use language to get people to do what you want. Anybody wants a recommendation of a translation, email me afterwards. <laughs> Everything he says about choosing your words, constructing a sentence and a point and a speech, how to use rhythm and imagery, how to pitch and pace your voice, it all still works as well today as it did in the fourth century BCE. But the most interesting sections are where he talks about the mechanics of argument. And not coincidentally, those are also the sections which highlight the tricky ethics of persuasion. Because Aristotle shows you how to make a formally logical argument, which if your premises are defensible, your facts are right and so on, will lead to a sound conclusion. But he also knows that the most persuasive arguments are rarely about facts or logic much more often they're about probabilities and the assumptions of the audience. So you might, for instance, start a speech by saying a few things we all know or think we know about human nature or the world we live in. And then applying those assumptions to your topic, you speculate about what is likely to be true or likely to be the best thing to do. And Aristotle called this type of argument an enthymeme. We call it probabilistic. And it is very familiar because it is the stuff of a great deal of contemporary public discourse. Not to mention computer algorithms and data analytics and AI. And it is attractive because it appeals to the accumulation of our lived experience, you know, the mosaic of observation and impression and inference and report that we build up over lifetimes, you know. And we rely on that all the time, and often it works quite well. Where it works less well is when the facts we're dealing with are novel or not typical, or we're gonna have to do something different from usual, because the enthymeme doesn't really encourage us to look at the specific, the actual, the new. 
But we, like Aristotle, live in a fast-changing world where it sometimes feels as if the facts and our good or realistic options are just changing all the time. And then, enthymemes become risky. And that, I think, is one of the major challenges of our public discourse today. But describing the enthymeme was not Aristotle's only major new contribution to rhetoric. He also saw that a crucial part of persuading anyone about anything is making them believe not just your words, but yourself. And credibility can be engineered. You do it by projecting a character which will resonate with your audience, which Aristotle called ethos, and appealing to their emotions, which he called pathos. And to construct the character that will appeal to your audience, you find out as much as possible about them, what they want, what they're frightened of, and then you present yourself as the person they need. Wise, energetic, forward-looking, whatever they're going to like. And in that character, you play on their emotions. Maybe you rile them up by telling them that your opponent is trying to take something away from them. Or calm them down by assuring them that whatever they want is what you want. The more precisely you can play on people's emotions, the more power you have. And along with the enthymeme, ethos and pathos are still the most powerful tools in all kinds of discourse today. And Aristotle could see, as well as we can, that this is a big risk, especially to the quality of public life and relationships, which was something he cared about a lot. And it worried him a lot. So he tried to find a way to tie rhetoric to morality and make it not just effective, but good. And roughly, he did it by arguing that the aim of human life is eudaimonia, happiness or human flourishing. And we flourish when we do what we are designed to do best, which he thought involves exercising reason in accordance with virtue, because he argued being good, part of being human. And so, according to Aristotle, someone who speaks in public could, in theory, be a self-interested, manipulative charlatan who only cares about wealth and power, but who would want to be such a person? <laughs> Problem seems to be that in practice, quite a lot of people are quite happy to be that person. When I was teaching my MBA students, I worried about that a lot. They were very nice people, I'd like just to say. <laughs> but I could teach them the elements of rhetoric in a day, and they were drinking it in. But I couldn't teach them to love goodness in a day. And if they didn't love goodness already, wasn't I just teaching them how to exploit people? And I never solved that problem. And I don't think we've solved it in education in general or in public life. And it is one of the big questions we face today. And not least when we study and teach in a university. Can we find ways to tie discourse and persuasion to goodness and truth more effectively than Aristotle? Well, my last story is about the most unexpected lesson I ever learned, which happened soon after I was ordained, about 22 years ago. At the time, I was a professor at Oxford, and as I started serving in a parish, it struck me that there were useful parallels between my university teaching and preaching and teaching in the parish, and also between my pastoral responsibilities for my students and my work with my congregation. And it seemed likely to me, and for me, that my experience of university teaching would inform my teaching in the parish, because I thought I was quite good, you know. <laughs> Been doing it for a while by then. You know. But my pastoral training for ministry 
might inform my pastoral work with students, for which I hadn't had any training at all. What happened was exactly the opposite. Because as a teacher, I would often play with ideas, spinning a line to see where it went, playing devil's advocate to make students think. You know, and it was fun. And it did make them think. And I didn't necessarily worry about whether it made for the best interpretation of the material. Getting them to think was enough. But you can't stand up in a pulpit and spin a line. Or if you do, you are making a fool of your own faith and your congregations. In a pulpit, you can only talk as honestly and carefully as you can about what you believe to be truth. So my congregation taught me that if something is worth teaching, it's worth teaching seriously. And it changed the way I taught. On the other hand, and some of you will know this, when you are ordained and put on any kind of clerical uniform, your congregation instantly concludes that you are much wiser and more pastorally gifted than you actually are. <laughs> and they will entrust you with their needs and fears and doubts in a way not many 30-year-olds are realistically well equipped to deal with. And it's so tempting to go along with it and pretend you are much wiser and more spiritual than you are. But that way lies self-deception and hypocrisy and potentially real harm to other people. I was saved from it, I hope, I think, by my students, because they knew I had no training in pastoral care for them. They certainly didn't think I had any gifts of the spirit. Weren't it? They were classicists. They weren't interested in that stuff. If they came to me, it was just on the basis of my lived experience, however limited. They wanted my honest opinion and no more. And I realized that essentially that was what I had to offer my congregation to. And it was not nothing. On a good day, it was not without the spirit. But I had better not imagine it was more than it was. So my students taught me humility in pastoral encounters, which I hope I've never forgotten. So three stories and three reflections on education. When we learn and teach and practice what we learn, we're trying to develop our human, physical, intellectual capabilities to the utmost. But we also have to learn to hold ourselves open to the inspiration that comes from far beyond us and is the thing that ignites what we say and do and reveals mysteries beyond our grasp. And we all want to communicate effectively, reach out to people and change hearts and minds. But if we do it only for our own benefit, without caring about goodness or truth, then what we say is liable to damage, even destroy, the very fabric of relationships and societies that we depend on. And sometimes, however accomplished we are, the most important lessons come from the most unexpected places. Which all brings us to the book of Proverbs and the passage we've just heard. The fascinating thing I find about ancient ethical or wisdom writing is that it is so rooted in and committed to the everyday, the world we live in. You know, and at the same time, it is so idealistic. You know, maybe more than any other genre of writing. It wants to do the fullest justice, both to the material and to the metaphysical domain. Wisdom walks the walls of her city. You know, she stands in the marketplace and looks around. She observes people and donkeys and swallows and ants. 
And she knows the value of a cellar full of wine and a business partner who keeps their word and a tradesman who doesn't lean on his scales. And she celebrates love and physical pleasure and worries about prostitution and gender relations. She celebrates community and worries when people fall out and abuse the law. And at the same time, she is just constantly tantalized and tries to infiltrate her listeners with the sense of a God whose thoughts and ways are as far above everyday life as the heavens are above the earth, who precedes and exceeds everything that is, who commands existence, and to whom everything belongs and is answerable, and whom we can never reach out and grasp, but whom we can meet and be shown that we are wonderfully made and learn that we are known and feel that we are loved and to whom we can respond with love and awe and learning because wisdom celebrates not least that God made humanity to learn about the world and about God and God like any teacher is delighted when humanity wants to learn. So in today's reading, wisdom says, listen to my instruction. Very keen, listen to my instruction. I have things to say. And find not only knowledge and expertise, but life itself, as the favor of the Lord falls on your learning and ignites it. Wait in my doorway and watch at my doors, because wisdom may come into your life from directions you didn't expect. And when you listen, you will hear wisdom speak both persuasively and trustworthily. A truth that touches those that hear it and turns their hearts and minds towards God. And that is Proverbs' way of squaring the circle that Aristotle struggled with between persuasion and goodness. And a writer does it essentially by seeing the source of persuasion and goodness as a personal God who actively creates humanity and determines its default state as good in relation to its creator. And that brings some challenges of its own, which we won't get into now. But it does offer a vision of how what we learn and how we communicate are connected with why we learn and why learning must be good. And to shape that vision, the writer looks back to the first creation narrative in the book of Genesis and makes wisdom say, the very first of God's works was me. And I was there, the word, when everything else was spoken into being. So I can tell you, but before you ever spoke a word, you were spoken. You are made of words. And if you speak in the way, some later commentators would say, in the image of the word which spoke everything into being, then your speech will be good, as the one who created you is good and saw that you were made good. But if your speech is self-serving, manipulative, untruthful, then you are no longer in, trust, in touch with its source. And what you say can only end badly. Well, here we are at the beginning of a new academic year, ready to learn, ready to teach, ready to enjoy our surroundings and our shared life here. And wisdom celebrates all those things and also points beyond them, saying, while you are working to learn and think and communicate the best you can, be open to that inspiration that ignites your learning beyond any human power. And while you're studying wisdom in the places you have chosen, don't forget that it sometimes comes from unexpected places. 
And remember that before you ever spoke or listened or read or wrote, you were spoken. And the words that do good in this world are the words that speak in the ways of wisdom and the word that brought us all into being. And last but not least, as you pursue wisdom, be as joyful as she is, as she rejoices in the presence of God and delights in humankind. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Morgan, for setting the foundation for our learning this year, and even more, for embodying in your own person the message we just heard. We're going to be dismissed in a word of prayer by Professor Hernandez Ocosta, and then would you please wait until the faculty exit, uh, and then join us for reception. Let's enjoy life in the old refectory. Let us pray. We end this year's opening convocation by first giving thanks for the blessings already bestowed. We give thanks for all the blessings that have made our gathering here today possible. We give thanks for the blessing of life in our lungs, for the countless hands that have helped guide us to where we stand, for the comforts of the building that shelters us. We give thanks for the blessing that is each and every one present, those whose names are already familiar to us, those whose names are new, those whose names we hold only in the secret of our hearts, and all those whose names we will never know. We have not come this far for naught, and so most wise and caring God, you who know how to draw near to us in our sorrow and in our joy, when we doubt and when we dare, bless us. Bless us in mind and body. Bless us when we work and when we rest. Bless us in our going out and our coming in. Bless us in ways we thought we could not be blessed. Bless us in ways we may not have even known we needed to be blessed. Bless us by letting us be a blessing. Bless us by teaching us how to be a blessing. For any way you deem to bless us, we pray. Amen.